Come on, don't you love your pastors? Come on. I love them. What is going down at the city? You can all have a seat, everybody. Make some noise, though, if you're alive and awake. Come on, come on. I love your pastors. Come on, every last one of them. Tony Faith. I, even, I love the kids on top of that cast. Gabby, Bella, you guys, I'm just saying, the, I, the, you guys realize how blessed you are, right? Because if, I mean, this is a world-changing family. I, I, and then on top of that, it's smart for pastors to take a break. That's called being healthy. And, uh, you know, it, but, but for real, you guys all need to be praying for your pastors daily. I, I really want to encourage you, please pray for your pastors daily because I'm just saying they're, they're, they're dynamic and you want them to be healthy for the long haul. And how do you get that? By praying for them, okay? And... And if, you're, and if you're worried today, you know, will Peter Haas keep me awake like Pastor Tony always does? Well, you can take a giant chill pill, okay? Because I, Tony is basically my twin brother from another mother. I'm just saying, okay? I'm even wearing my custom City Church merch today. So basically, the anointing of Tony is on me. In fact, all you got to do, all you got to do to preach like Tony is just imagine yourself as a pro wrestler with great shoes, and then you got to preach the word as though every single word has a period after it. Boom, Tony, am I right? Did I just do it? I... I'm just, I'm going to get you, for real though, Tony, I love you, man, I love you, I love you, and uh, there are very few preachers I could listen to every week, and you're one of them, okay, and I, I never say that, okay, so just, but today, I want to speak to all you dreamers out there, come on, anybody, are there any big dreamers in the room, you know if you're married to a dreamer, you know, my wife is like, my wife would say I dream too much, okay? And, but I don't know if that's possible, okay? I, I'm not, listen, some of you, you had big dreams at one point, and yet you've gotten caught up in this mindset that, you know, maybe today you're thinking, you know, it's too late for me. I'm too far behind. I've made too many mistakes, you know, or maybe you're thinking, uh, you know, Pastor Peter, you don't even know how complicated my family is, how complicated my past is, how messed up my body is. You've got these ideas in your head that you think define God and maybe for the average human on earth, it does define them. But you know what? We don't define our lives by our circumstances. We define ourselves by what the Word of God says about us and by the power and the size of the God we serve, okay? So, so in fact, actually, I, I, like, if you've ever felt like life has passed you by, if you've ever felt overlooked or forgotten or underpromoted or you listen I, you you have to listen really close because scripture teaches that oftentimes that feeling is actually a spirit and that spirit can oppress you and if you don't know how to actively resist that spirit listen it can devour you but before I prove it to you today okay I, but I, I want to start by recapping one of those famous Old Testament stories some of you you've heard it a million times but I want you to listen to it with fresh ears it's the story of the 12 spies who are spying out the promised land the land of Canaan in Numbers chapter 13. And just to kind of give you context in case you forgot this story, okay, just to recap it real quick, at the time Moses was the leader of God's people, the Israelites, and of course, you know, God had just brought them out of Egypt, God had done, you know, millions of miracles, and yet look what Deuteronomy 132 says about the Israelites. Even after they saw all of these miracles, miracle after miracle after miracle, listen to what Deuteronomy 132 says in in spite of all that God had previously done, they did not trust the Lord, their God. Okay, think about this. Okay, they'd seen the miracles. And, and, and listen, I think we all have that in us, right? The moment God actually answers our prayer, gives us the promotion that we were praying for, what do we do? We just go on worrying about the next thing. 
What's my next worry after that, right? And so they begged Moses, please, Moses, allow us to send spies into the promised land so that we can create our own strategy. Like, they didn't trust God's strategy. They wanted to get their own strategy. And so, you know, to accommodate their immaturity, God finally said in Numbers 13, fine. Fine. You, you don't trust me? Fine. Okay, well then, here's what you're going to do. I want you to, to, to select 12 leaders from each of your tribes, and I want you to go spy out the land, and then you can come back over the report and figure it out for yourselves, okay? So, so from God's perspective, though, all this spy business was complete nonsense. He didn't need them to do this, and they didn't need to do it. I mean, God already had a plan for them to supernaturally overtake the land. But, but so really, basically, this whole spy thing was God accommodating their carnal lack of faith to bolster their confidence. It was ridiculous, okay? And just maybe after these 12 spies come back, they're all gonna get fired up and they'll finally do what I'm asking them to do. But now, as a parent, have you ever tried to get your kids fired up to do something they didn't wanna do? Come on, some of you are like, this morning, right? You were like, like I, I remember like trying to get my kids to clean their room. My oldest daughter, she would always respond all of a sudden if I turned it into like a, like a game in a world of imagination. I'd go up to my daughter and I'd be like, okay, you're Cinderella and I'm Cinderella's helper and, and we're gonna, you know, I'd create this world of make-believe and then, and, and then suddenly she would clean the room. You know what I'm saying? Like it like would work, right? It was like my life hack for my oldest daughter, right? So I tried the same thing with my son, right? Except Instead of Cinderella, it was Star Wars. He always wanted to be Yoda, and I was like his Jedi assistant, you know? And of course, the moment I'd be like, let's prep for battle by cleaning, he would be like, oh no, no. Padawans do not tell Jedi masters what to do. <laughs> oh, you little punk. How many of you know I went fully to the dark side. You know what I'm saying? I will show you the dark side. Uh, you know what I mean? I will, <laughs> it's like, again, strong with the force you are, you know, like, oh, he didn't even know, right? So unfortunately, unfortunately in the story of the 12 spies, that's exactly what God was trying to do, get them all fired up, and sure enough, it didn't work. And so instead of getting fired up to obey, the Bible says 10 of the 12 spies melted down into a total wine fest and poisoned the entire nation of Israel. They came home and they said, there's no way we can defeat these Canaanites. They're huge. And we can't even do it with God's help. Okay, all the miracle he, he did over Pharaoh, there's no way he's going to do the same thing here. And, but then there were these two spies, Joshua and Caleb, who were like, heck no, our God can do anything, let's take the land, right? But by that point, it was too late. The 10 spies had already poisoned millions of Israelites, so now they're weeping and whining when they should have been having a party, and some of them even started conspiring to kill Moses and Aaron, and plus the two good spies, Joshua and Caleb, and then they were planning on going back to Egypt as if that was a good idea. How dumb of an idea was that? And so finally, God says, enough. I'm done with all y'all. All y'all are gonna die in the wilderness. Every single one of you who is over 20 years old, you're gone, okay? I'm gonna use, because I love you so much, I'm gonna use your kids, but I'm not gonna use you, is basically what he said, okay? So check out what he says, Numbers 14, 21. It's kind of intense, but let me read it to you. As surely as I live, God says, and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me 10 times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. Not no one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit. Caleb means faithful in Hebrew. It also means dog because dogs are faithful, but it means faithful. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. Come on. How many of you know your decisions actually affect generations? For some of us, that's not good. You know what I mean, right? We're looking at our lives and you're like, ah, I don't want my kids to have to deal with it, right? You wanna know why you wanna deal with your issues? Because if you don't, your kids will have to deal with it. 
and your grandkids will have to deal with it. And so get this, okay? So just, <laughs> I mean, it, generations are affected, right? And, and so immediately after this, God sent a plague, literally took out the 10 spies on the spot. They all died, and everyone in Israel was like, whoa, we screwed up, dad's mad, and dad never gets mad. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay, that's, that's kind of what happened, okay? So now go back to verse 24, and let me reread this, okay? Because God says something unique about Caleb, and I do not want you to miss this, okay? In verse 24, God says, but because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to. His descendants will inherit it, okay? But because my servant Caleb has a different what? A different spirit. Now, what does that mean, a different spirit? I mean, like, how is the spirit different? I mean, I suppose I could go into all the classic reasons, you know, like, you know, Caleb believed God's report instead of man's report. You know, Caleb was like, it doesn't matter how big the Canaanites are. They're already destined to, to fail. You know what I'm saying? He, he had a different spirit. It doesn't matter how small we are, how behind we are. I mean, we could point out any number of things, right? I mean, it doesn't matter if the doctor says it's turned because God's report says he's going to heal us. It doesn't matter if you think it's permanent. God says, I can remove permanent things. Come on. We serve a God who parts the stinking sea, right? That's what Caleb, that's what Caleb was thinking, okay? The normal order is not, is, we don't have to think about the normal order. You know, like many of you guys know, like remember when I was, when I was here last time, I shared a story of my 10-year-old daughter who had a vision of, of a building, um, like, like I, I, a prophetic word about our downtown campus. I'm not going to tell the whole story, but I have a part two to that story that I never shared. But let me just, if you missed that, let me just quickly recap it, okay? Uh, my, my 10-year-old daughter basically came up to me and said, Daddy, uh, the Lord told me that by this time next Thursday, you're going to find a building with a balcony covered in red. And it, when you look up, you're going to say, wow. And she even drew a picture of the building God showed her and gave it to me, okay? And sure enough, that next week, I walked into that very building. And, you know, in this, like, here's a picture of it. Like, you can, it, it's a little tight on the screen, but literally, she nailed the picture identically, okay? So she drew, she had never seen the building. She... She had never seen the building, but she nailed it exactly. She drew all these pictures from a vision God had shown her, and it was so exact that, that I kind of freaked out. My brain melted down, and uh, she said, you'll know this building is the one when you look up and say, wow, and of course, the building has a glass dome over the auditorium. I just said, wow, and then it freaked me out, like, oh my gosh, I just did it, just like she said, right? So like, I, I kind of freaked out, and she said, you're not, she goes, you're going to decide on Thursday to get it, and it was so specific, right? I mean, it was almost like bizarre, precocious, and it happened exactly like my daughter said, my my. My board, we all walked into this building and we're like, we have to go for this building. And then, and then my daughter came running up to me, showed me the picture. H having never seen it, it was identical to the picture I took four hours earlier. So I freaked out. We made a decision to go for it that Thursday. Now, here's the part of the story I, I didn't share last time and that I, a lot of times I don't share, but it's really important that you understand this, okay? So God gave us this like supernatural moment through my daughter that we were supposed to buy this building. Um, yet, what I don't share is that it took us a good four to five years to even get into that building, okay? I mean, it took a long time. In other words, like we had this supernatural story of, of God wanting us to get this building, but guess what? So we paid to have it appraised. I mean, it cost us like 30, 40 grand to get this building appraised. And uh, I mean, it's expensive, right? Commercial real estate in our downtown is very expensive. And, and then we even made an offer to purchase it. And then the, the real estate agent took like three months to even get back to us. I mean, it was almost like, what is going on and then said absolutely not we're not interested in selling it to you and then the whole deal died right so then you know we waited five months and then we reappraised it redid the offer again and then waited took forever all of a sudden nothing right okay literally that happened 
four or five times over the coming years, and, and it wasn't working for us, and, and, and it turned out the reason, we actually figured out the reason why was the real estate agent who was listing it, he didn't want us to get it, get it. In fact, every time we put an offer in, he wouldn't even show it to the board. And part of the reason why is because he was trying to use our offer to get um, competing bids from all these different hotels that he wanted to get it because he knew if he can get a hotel to get it, then all of a sudden he can get like a, an extra million dollars in his pocket from a commission check. So he wasn't even showing our offers to the board. Of course, you know what I mean? Like, And so all these big players, heck, Prince, the artist, formerly known as, you know, even tried to go for it, right? I mean, like, all these people were, like, going for this building, even though we had this prophetic word, and I, I think what messed with me throughout that whole season is, I'm like, God, why did you give us this crazy prophetic word, this miracle through my daughter, and, and this vision and then it's not happening year after year after year after year. In fact, I even had a pastor on my staff who resigned over that. He's like, I don't think your daughter had a vision from the Lord. I think she, she just happened to, you know, draw a picture that just looked similar to a building. I don't think it was the Lord at all. And then he started telling people that. Like, I don't think this is a miracle at all. I think Peter is just like kind of getting caught up in some weird fairy tale thing, and this is a disaster. And then people literally started coming up to me, leaving our church in that season, saying, I think you're just way off base. I don't even believe in all that nonsense. People started leaving our church year after year after year over that thing. So, you know, yeah, it preaches really great as a miracle, but let me tell you, it was really the same as the report from the 10 spies versus the, versus the two. It, it was like, whose report are you going to believe, right? Are you going to believe, are you going to believe this, this thing that could be from God? I mean, I think it might be from God. I mean, how in the world is that possible other than God, right? But, but whose spirit, I had to make a decision about my spirit. Am I going to have the spirit of the Israelites, the spirit of the world, or the spirit of Caleb? My God can do anything. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and obviously, you guys know the story. I mean, um, just like God removed the walls of Jericho, God removed that real estate agent, and boom, God gave us a $40 million building for $2 million. And, and there, are, there are literally thousands of people that attend that campus, and it's thriving. And, and guess who all came back? All the people who were like, this is not God. Guess who wanted his job back and who didn't get it back? You know what I'm saying? Like, I, well, you know, we won't go there, but we, because this is being recorded. But I'm just saying, you know, I, I just, guess who will all of a sudden say, oh, I guess it was God after the fact. You know what I'm saying? Can I, can I really be honest with you, though? Those betrayals were kind of deep from those years. Because you know what? Um, it wasn't merely just the real estate agent. It was, it was all the people who left with, with such meanness throughout that season. I mean, it actually swung our income by over a million dollars. I had to lay people off because of the faith of some of these people in our church. And I, I, I think about that, and I, I think, you know, in the story of Caleb, think about this. Be, Caleb was... Caleb and Joshua were like, hey, I believe God's report. The rest were saying no, right? He had a lot of reasons to be mad at his friends because guess what? His friends cost him 40 years. Their lack of faith cost him 40 years. Imagine if because of the faith of the people around you, you get locked up in prison for 40 years. That's really what we're reading in this story with Caleb. I mean, other people's sins cost him, and he could have played the victim, but guess what? 45 years later, guess what the Bible says about Caleb, okay? In Joshua 14, 10, I didn't, I didn't find this scripture until like years later, okay? I, I never put it together. Years later, Joshua 14, 10, this is 45 years later. The Bible teaches Caleb is now 85 years old when he says, when he says what I'm about to read, okay? It, it, but it says God gave him the body of a 40-year-old, okay? Check this out, Joshua 14, 11. It says, Joshua says, I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out, way back in the day. 
I'm just as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me on that day. Come on. I love it when an 85-year-old is like feisty, pull out a sword, like I'm going into battle. You know what I'm saying? Think about it, though. God gave him the body of a 40-year-old. What does that say? First off, if God can do it for him, he can do it for you. Some of you, you think you're already like, you're, you're 40 years old, and you're like, my body's falling apart. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're, you know what I mean? Like, God can reverse age. You know that, right? You know that he did it. He's done it multiple times. You see, no wonder God said Caleb has a different spirit, right? Because the rest of us would have been like, it's too late for me to even enjoy it. I'm 85 years old. My life is already over. I've lived in the wilderness. I might as well not even go in. You know what I'm saying? I'm too far behind. My goodness, I'll probably have like two years and then I'll croak. You know what I'm saying? Every week, I have to listen to Christians who create arbitrary timelines as though God is governed by those, right? If I'm not proposed to, promoted by, or pregnant by such and such an age, it's over for me, right? You think God is limited by your rules? Come on, the Bible is filled with stories of people that defy the odds. I could mention Abraham and Sarah, who the Bible describes them as good as dead. When somebody describes you as, ah, they're as good as dead. Okay, that's not a good descriptor, right? But yet, then they had kids, right? I could mention Joseph stuck in a prison for the best days of his life before he became the, most, the second most powerful person on earth. I could mention Moses, who tried to make his dreams happen at 40, and yet God was like, Moses, you need to chill. All of your best days are gonna start at 80. Everything we know about Moses really happened after 80 years old, okay? And God extended Moses' life too. Come on, people, these are not isolated miracles for God. Yeah, but Pastor Peter, you don't know my spouse or my old wicked boss, how they stole so many years of my life. But church, listen, that's what made Caleb's spirit different. He knew he could not be a victim and a victor at the same time. You can't. You cannot. You cannot be a victor when you're pointing the finger either, okay? Because that pointing the finger actually is, is you saying, I'm trying to argue that I'm the victim. You cannot be a victim and a victor at the same time. You see, Caleb knew it doesn't matter what's been done to me, and the passage of time does not equal the passing of opportunity. Hear me. The passage of time does not mean the passing of opportunity. And some of you, 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 you need to hear that word today because God wants you to defy the odds. I think about, uh, there, there's this, one of my favorite stories, it's about a, a young woman back in the mid-1800s, young farm girl by the name of Anna Robertson. She was born uh, right after Abraham Lincoln took office, and of course, she grew up on a farm in New York State, and of course, in those days, less than 6% of women um, uh, had a job outside of the home, uh, would make any money, so people like her were not allowed to have aspirations, and, and in many ways, her life was pretty tough. You know, I mean, she gave birth to 10 kids, Five of them died. Think about that. Five of them died. In fact, in her 78 years of farming, I mean, she worked a farm the hard way, old school equipment. The only time she ever took off was nine days because of one of her complicated pregnancies, and that ain't a vacation. You know what I'm saying, okay? So she was one tough cookie, and, uh, and, and, and though she loved God, but her life was not idyllic, but the one, she had one love in her life, one thing that she loved to do, and it's, it might sound funny, one hobby and aspiration, it was embroidery. She loved to do embroidery. Come on, any embroiderers out there? Most of you are not like, you're just the front row. Yeah, you're like, Whoa! Most people who do embroidery are not the rowdy crowd. You know what I mean? They're, in fact, they're probably at home right now knitting, watching this message. You know what I'm saying? But I, I just, no, for real, uh, she loved needlework, 
And she would always do needlework of just different farm landscapes that she remembered as a kid. She even won a blue ribbon at the fair, you know. But after all her years of farming, I mean, come on, 78 years, uh, you know, her arthritis became so bad in her mid-70s that she could barely hold a needle anymore. And, uh, you know, it was almost like the number one love in her life was being taken away from her at 76 years old. And it was frustrating. She, she grieved it. And I, 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 you know what? Every week I hear people who are in a similar grieving process where maybe, you know, it, life is filled with grieving processes, isn't it? You know, life is filled with identity crises that, you know, we planned our lives to look like this and it's not looking like that. Or, or we, we got what we wanted, but then all of a sudden it fell apart on us. So we lost that job, that dream, you know, like what, and then we're asking questions like, why would God allow this injury to kill my dream of pro sports? You know, like why would I get passed by when I devoted my life and I got that expensive degree and now I'm not doing fill in the blank. You know what I'm saying? I think life is filled with processes like that. And when we go through those moments, it's easy to get weird. It's easy to all of a sudden, you know, get up in our heads. So in the midst of this, Anna's kind of going through this. She can't even hold a needle anymore. And finally, Anna's sister just suggested to her, hey, Anna, you know what? You may not be able to hold a needle, but how about like a paintbrush? It's like a little bigger. You can hold that. Maybe you should try painting. And Anna's thinking, I really? Like, I don't want to paint. I like, and she's like, whatever. And then finally the, Anna's sister is like, hey, listen, the drugstore down the road, if you just would do some paintings, they'll sell them for like three bucks, split the profit. And of course, Anna was looking for a side hustle. She was like, okay, fine. Out of desperation, why not? So instead of needlework, she took up painting at 76 years old. Okay. Now, even though, okay, so she started putting these paintings over at the drugstore. Nobody bought them, but even still, it was still fun to kind of, you know, just show them off at the local drugstore. At the very least, it was a healthy hobby for her. And, and then one day, a collector, an art collector, happened to be driving through New York, stopped at the drugstore. He was from New York City, and he saw Anna Robertson's paintings. They were so old-timey, and they were folk art, but man, he was hypnotized by these paintings. He was like, and so he asked the drugstore clerk, who did these? And they were like, oh, old Anna, she's down the road, she's a, she's a farmer. Um, and he, he literally bought all of her paintings on the spot and said, where can I get more? Can I go to Anna's farm? And they're like, yeah, they pointed him in the direction. And guess what? He bought all of Anna's art, took it back to New York City, and showed it in every gallery he could. He loved this stuff. And wouldn't you know, all of a sudden, in her early 80s, people all over the world started loving Anna's art. In fact, the interest in her paintings got so large that when she turned 87 years old, Hallmark Cards came to her and said, hey, we want to sign a deal with you. We want to take your art and put it on our Christmas cards. In fact, here's a little picture of one of the, the Christmas cards that they, they oh, get this, okay? By 1950, when she turned 90 years old, her folk art paintings were everywhere. They were putting them on jigsaw puzzles. They were putting them on magazines. They were putting them on calendars. They were putting them on decorative plates. You name it. In fact, she actually ended up making this style of folk art famous. And by 1960, she became one of the single most important folk artists in all of American art history. And Ab Anna Robertson is known by the nickname Grandma Moses. And here's like the Time Magazine article about her. Like she, she was invited to meet three different U.S. presidents. I mean, she did portraits for them. And by 1965, they made one of her paintings into a postage stamp. Hallmark cards sold over 100 million cards with her paintings on it. And believe it or not, she did over 2,000 paintings after she turned 80. Oh, I'm not even done. She got two doctorates after she turned 80. And okay, get this. Even after she turned 100 years old, she did another 25 paintings, many of which sold for over a million dollars. Okay, and <laughs> come on, somebody. 
I'm just saying, it's never too late. Stop putting limits on God. He does not operate like you think. Don't equate the passing of time as the passing of opportunity. God can bend time. In fact, in 1948, when she turned 88 years old, Mademoiselle magazine, which was you know one of the biggest uh, women magazines in the world, they awarded her at 88 years old the Young Woman of the Year Award. Right. Wait, what? What? She was, she was 88 years old? Isn't that supposed to be for young women? Listen, God, God can change reality for you, okay? I'm just saying, he did it for Caleb. I think it's appropriate that her name is, you know, nickname was Grandma Moses, right? Because Moses didn't really kick things off until 80 either. I love that. I love that. I, I just, listen, here's the truth. When we get impatient, when we allow fear to sneak into our lives, that's when we take on the spirit of the Israelites, the spirit of the world, rather than the spirit who is from God, the spirit of Caleb, right? We have not been given the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given to us, Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Come on, that's that when we receive the spirit of the world, that's when we start to complain. That's when we start to point the finger, to play the victim, and that's also when we die in the wilderness, church. Come on, why? Because we're interpreting de delays as denials, which is not true, okay? In fact, just allow this last statement to sink in, okay? Delays do not mean God is disinterested in me, disappointed in me, or denying me. And a lot of people, they think that delays equal disinterest, disappointment or denials that's not true you are you are tying things together in your mind w w that are demonic whispers into your ears that are not how God feels God does not think like you think or feel like you feel the passing of time is not equal the passing of opportunity and if God can turn Caleb's 85 year old body into a 40 year old guess what he can bend time for you and and, and church I've collected hundreds of stories like these I mean come on I, I literally I could have I could have ended this message with any number of stories I mean come on God enabled Beethoven to write his greatest symphony after he went deaf God enabled Susanna Wesley to become one of the most influential women in all of church history after her husband dragged her life down for decades. Talk about a downer, and yet she ended up changing the world for women in the church. God enabled Handel, like Handel's Messiah, the, the composer, to write his most lucrative symphony for God after his reputation was completely destroyed. God enabled an old widow named Lady Huntington at, at, towards the end of her life to plant 116 Methodist churches. God enabled an impoverished retiree by the name of Colonel Sanders to start Kentucky Fried Chicken with 100 bucks and he got baptized at 77 years old, and God used him to fund the kingdom and give huge quantities of money to the church, millions of dollars, and good chicken. Come on. Every last one of these people I just mentioned had a God moment really late in life that defied time, and God used every last one of them to do crazy things for the kingdom when a lot of people would have counted them out. Okay, and here's the truth, okay? I want you just to absorb this for a second, okay? Because I think this will change you. Even if you and I don't get the rewards on earth that we're so expecting, that we're looking for, I'm telling you, they're sure to happen in heaven. You gotta have an eternal perspective when you follow the Lord. Because here's the truth, okay? Just imagine this. This is gonna sound a little weird, but imagine if I could tell you with absolute certainty if I could prophesy over you today, if I could tell you this, guess what? You're gonna die young, you're gonna die tragically, and you're only gonna have, at most, two to three years of success, half of which are gonna be really stressful. Imagine if I said that to you with absolute certainty. How would you feel? You're gonna die young, you're gonna die tragically, and at best, have three good years half of which are gonna be stressful, most of you would be like, I rebuke that thought, right? 
And yet I just described the greatest life that has ever been lived in all of human history, that of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let that sink in. Because guess what? If you could talk to him today, and technically you can, he doesn't regret any, any, any second of his life. In fact, he's enjoying life even more, right? Indeed, when we lose our lives, we find them, Luke 9, 24. Come on. Come on. Don't ever say it's too late. Instead, say, God is too good. Because you want to know what God will say when you do that? He'll be like, angels, come on over here. See that person? They have a different spirit. They have a spirit like Caleb. And guess what? At the proper time, I'm going to bless the heck out of that person. That's what he would say about you. So just right now, just close your eyes. Father, you see all the dreams that are put into our hearts. You know what we're going through what we're thinking about. You know all the arbitrary timelines that we've created, and yet you've got a plan to redeem us in the midst of all of that. I pray that every last person would just surrender their lives to you right here, right now. In fact, if you're here today and you've never received Christ before, I wanna just encourage you just right now in this prayer, just receive him. Receive him right here. Just, in fact, pray this prayer after me, wherever you're at, all of you, just say, Dear Jesus, I give my life to you. I wanna know you. I want to make you known, and I trust you starting today and for the rest of my life. If you believe that prayer, just between you and God, just say, I believe that. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. Amen? Love you guys.